Welcome back to another Fat Ninja Studios review video. I'm your host, Raging Anybody, and before we begin, major spoiler warning ahead. This video will also be longer than those of the previous weeks, given the amount of content in this episode. Last week, we brought out a theory of ours that the story for Loki was a version of the Battleworld event from the comics. As stated by Feige himself, the future of the MCU would be bringing more storylines to life but with their own spin on it. We gave a quick overview of what the comic book arc contained and a few key moments that linked our theory, but after watching episode 5, we are even more confident in our theory. Throughout this breakdown, we will be pointing out some interesting easter eggs as well as building up our theory on what's going to go down in the final episode, as well as the future of phases 4 and 5 in the MCU. A quick recap before we get started. In the last episode, Mobius and Loki, as well as Hunter B-15 and Sylvie, teamed up to try and stop the Timekeepers, but were however thwarted as Mobius was pruned shortly after retrieving Loki from the time loop. Later, when Renslinger brings both Loki and Sylvie before the Timekeepers, a battle ensues and one of them is decapitated, only to be revealed as a robot. Loki is then pruned during a tender moment with Sylvie, and in an after credit scene, it's revealed that he's sent to another dimension where he encounters more variants of himself. The episode kicks off in a cool upside-down shot, signifying that not all is right in the TVA. The camera then zooms in on a golden door, decorated with symbols that look a lot like hourglasses. We fade into the destroyed landscape of a dimension where pruned variants arrive, and one of our first easter eggs is the Lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the world, which unfortunately was destroyed and sank into the ocean after a series of earthquakes through the early 1000s. Next up are some scattered letters, R-N-X-D-V, and also what looks like a big red question mark. Not sure what they mean, maybe initials of the person behind the special effects, or a clue to what's to come. If you have any ideas, let us know in the comments. Following that is Kang Tower. In the comics, Kang Enterprises is run by a man named Mr. Griffin, a split version of Kang the Conqueror, who reprograms Vision to help him take over the world and create the Kang Dynasty Empire. Eventually, Tony Stark is able to get Vision back to his old self, and Thor uses a time-displaced Mjolnir to create a temporal paradox to trap Mr. Griffin. Opposite Kang Tower, a building looks like it says Greg Pak 2019 at the top. This could be a reference to the Marvel Comics writer of the same name, who is behind famous storylines such as Planet Hulk, World War Hulk, and more recently, the Agents of Atlas series. We catch up to Loki, getting up off the ground as old man Loki explains where they all are. This is the void, that's Elioth, and we're his lunch, come on! We then see Elioth emerge from a great big storm cloud, roaring and emanating some kind of massive red energy. In the comics, Elioth is the first being to ever break free from the constraints of time, and its domain rivals that of Kang's temporal empire. Kang even had to go as far as to create a barrier to stop Elioth from taking over his territory. However, Throughout this episode, we believe it's Elioth who's being used as a barrier to keep Kang out of who is actually behind the TVA, but we'll get to that in a bit. The opening credits roll, and we cut to Sylvie, demanding answers from Renslayer. Renslayer hands over her tempad, and Sylvie asks who's behind the TVA. Renslayer says she doesn't know, and well, we kind of believe her. Theory time. We think that much like her comic book counterpart, she is a lover of Kang the Conqueror. In the show, however, we think she was sent here undercover to find a way to create a Nexus event or something similar to be able to get close to the real timekeepers, and she's doing this at Kang's bidding. As we mentioned in our last video, we believe that God King Doom is actually behind it all, trying to create a utopian universe under his rule, and that it threatens Kang's domain. Using his knowledge of magic and engineering, Dr. Doom was able to tap into the time stream and forge events into a path that would ultimately lead to the collapse of the multiverse, where only his universe would survive. 
The world that Loki wakes up on is Battle World. Basically, a place to dispose of the garbage. Kind of like how Superman does with the Phantom Zone. This is obviously different from the way Battle World is shown in the comics, but it does make sense in the MCU. Battle World is most likely the Deadlands domain, whereas Doom resides in perfection, and the TVA exists in an equivalent to New Xandar. But we'll come back to that in a bit. Renslayer tries to dupe Sylvie into a false sense of security, telling her that they all want the same thing, which again, we don't think she's lying, but she also doesn't want to make whoever is watching suspicious. She reveals that pruned variants don't actually die, that they go to this alternate dimension, and no one has ever escaped from it. Renslayer asks Sylvie to trust her, and Sylvie reluctantly hands over the tempad. We cut back to the void as the five Lokis are now wandering across the plains surrounded by debris from many different timelines. We immediately are hit with two more Easter eggs. The Flying Dutchman, which you might know from Pirates of the Caribbean films, or it could also be the Mary Celeste, a ship that was left abandoned and adrift in the 1800s. An added hint to this is that earlier in the TVA, it showed Nova Scotia on the timeline monitor which is where the ship was initially built. Secondly, a giant shield, or it could also be a UFO. If it's the shield, it's most likely the Aegis, belonging to the Greek god Zeus. Since characters like Hercules exist in Marvel Comics, this could be a nod to his storyline. If it's just a UFO, then I guess it fits with the whole idea of mysterious things vanishing from the real timeline, but that's really unclear. Next, we see a three-winged rocket, probably a reference to the Bell X-2, also nicknamed the Starbuster, an, experiment, an experimental plane created by the government to test mock speeds. Red Skull also used one of these to escape during Captain America. Beyond that are several massive stone heads scattered about, and as giants do exist in the Marvel comics, these could either be statues of them or their remains. There are also these little blue bird-like creatures with floating orbs for heads. These probably hail from Chandelar, a planet inhabited by the Shi'ar who descended from avian species. Loki asks the group to slow down, and they tell them they can't stop, or Elias will catch up to them and kill them all. But Loki wants some answers and quickly loses his temper. Will someone please explain to me what the hell is going on? Kid Loki gets up in his face to tell him to calm down, before explaining the whole situation. A discussion breaks out between them involving whether or not the alligator is also a Loki variant and then leading into possible escape attempts. Old man Loki chides him, saying they've tried it all and it all ended the same way, with various Lokis dying at the hands of the big smoke monster. When a shark tank, life is the shark. For some reason, there's a huge pile of lunch trays in the middle of the field but we couldn't come up with anything for its significance. Loki decides to follow the rest of the group, but questions why they let a child lead. The old man replies that this world is his kingdom, but when Loki asks what he did that makes him so special, Kid Loki replies, He killed Thor. This quiets Loki, but also makes him somewhat sad, as he misses his brother. They continue their journey, and shortly after we get a nice shot of the helmet belonging to Yellowjacket, but in giant form, cracked and discarded on the hillside. This could possibly symbolize that at the end of Ant-Man, when he shrunk beyond the atomic level, he could have ended up here, making this place a pocket universe. Pocket universes are common in Marvel, with skilled reality warpers like Franklin Richards able to create them in his own bedroom. That, or in his reality, he defeated Ant-Man and tried taking over the world in giant size before being pruned and then devoured by allies. The next easter egg, of course, is the mighty Thanos Copter. In Spidey Super Stories number 39, Thanos attacked Hellcat, trying to steal the cosmic cube from her. Later, as Thanos grew in popularity and his origins were re revamped, he was given the floating chair, but characters like Deadpool have never let him live it down that he once flew in a helicopter with his name printed on the side. Next to the copter is what looks like to be a thermo-neutron missile, 
which is used by the scrolls to wipe out populations on entire planets. Old Man Loki opens up a hatch beside the discarded warhead and ushers his compatriots inside. The camera begins to pan down, showing us what's buried in the layers of dirt. First, of course, are more lunch trays, which we still don't have any idea about. Following that is Mjolnir, and right below that, a glass jar with the label 365 on it. Inside the jar is Throg, a variant of Thor when he was turned into a frog. The numbers 365 correspond to the issue number of when this story takes place. When the camera finally finishes panning down into the bunker, there are a litany of Easter eggs, too many to count almost, so we picked a few we thought were interesting. The first thing we saw was a bunch of discarded bowling pins. These are a reference to Alvin Healy, also known as Tenpin, a villain who uses weighted bowling pins as weapons. Next are the various candy canes and Christmas decorations. Recently, there was an animated movie called Marvel Superhero Avengers Frostfight, where Loki kidnaps Santa and tries to destroy Christmas. Tucked away, though, in the corner is a Polybius machine. This is related to a conspiracy theory that the government created a video game in the 1980s in order to test psychoactive effects on people and possibly recruit them for some mind control experiments. The game supposedly suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth, but the conspiracy is still talked about amongst many gamers to date. We cut back to the TVA and Renslayer asks Miss Minutes to bring up all the files related to the beginning of time. Now, many people believe Miss Minutes is behind it all, and it could be, but we here at Fat Ninja think that she's just a tool for Renslayer, a way for her to communicate with Kang. She was probably just a virtual intelligence before, and then upgraded to a fully sentient AI, and through that, possibly decided to aid Renslayer and betray her original creator. That, or it is still fully loyal to whoever is behind the TVA, and since Renslayer is still playing loyal herself, most likely having signaled Miss Minutes using the temp pad to call for reinforcements, it's just helping her stall for time. Sylvie argues that they should look at the end of time, however, explaining that if she was able to hide in apocalypses, since those timelines would end and be discarded, that given the end of time hasn't been written yet, the TVA would also be unable to monitor this point. Renslayer actually looks impressed, as if this gives her a place to look for answers. Sylvie asks how they get beyond the void to the end of time, and Renslayer tells her it's impossible. When Sylvie threatens to end their partnership if she's no longer useful, Miss Minutes chimes in with a fake plan to use the Void spaceship. Renslayer quickly plays along as Miss Minutes begins to search for the file on the ship, of course continuing to stall for time so that the Minutemen can charge in and save the day. Moments later, the TVA troops storm in, but not before Sylvie has noticed how badly Renslayer is trying to lie and quickly knocks her back, fleeing behind the judge desk. Renslayer tries to coerce her to giving herself up promising to lock her into a time loop instead of pruning her, one with a happy memory. This triggers Sylvie to think about Loki, and she defiantly prunes herself. Renslayer is left flabbergasted, unable to tell the other Minutemen that pruning doesn't mean death, but we think this is exactly what she wanted, for Sylvie to charge into the void and find out who's behind it all. Since Sylvie stole the temp pad from Renslayer, this could be a way for Renslayer to track her and possibly portal to her location. We cut back to the bunker in the void, and another easter egg is on screen. This time, it's Roxy Wine, a reference to Roxxon, which looks like it's being set up heavily to be the next big bad corporation in the MCU. Boastful Loki begins spinning a yarn about how he vanquished Captain America and Iron Man right before stealing all six Infinity Stones. Alligator Loki snarls disapprovingly, to which Old Man Loki translates that Boastful Loki is nothing but a liar. That's alligator for growling and saying liar at the same time. Well, at least my Nexus event wasn't eating the wrong neighbor's cat. This prompts a small skirmish between Boastful Loki and Alligator Loki. Kid Loki changes the vibe, though, having Old Man R Loki recall his story. We learn that in Old Man Loki's timeline, it played out almost exactly the same as the main timeline up until Thanos attacked Thor's ship. 
Instead of having his neck snapped by Thanos, Old Man Loki conjured up an illusion powerful enough to trick the Mad Titan and escaped his demise by hiding among the debris. He traveled to a secluded planet where he grew old and alone, and then one day wanted to leave and go see his brother Thor when the TVA finally showed up and pruned him. How did the TVA find you? I got lonely. On the table beside Old Man Loki is a cup with a character carved into it wearing a big red hat. We think this is a reference to Ringmaster, a villain from the comics who used to have a unique red hat that would allow him to hypnotize his foes. It could, however, also be a reference to El Toro Rojo, a Delta Network deviant bonded to a Hispanic autistic child. Old Man Loki goes on to call all Lokis the gods of outcasts and raises his glass in sheer. Kid Loki also raises an Ecto Cooler high C juice box in agreement. Loki, unwilling to lie down and take defeat, tells them he's going to get out of the void and tries to rally him to all join him by promising that he will kill Elioth. They all have a hearty laugh though, and Loki leaves to climb out of the bunker. <laughs> However, he is stopped by a parade of variants waiting at the top, including Ninja Loki, African Loki, Rainbow Girl Loki, Parachute Airman Loki, Russian Loki, Korean Loki, and they're all led by President Loki from the Vote Loki series published in 2016. We cut to Sylvie waking up in a ruined bus, getting her bearings, before fleeing from Eliath and briefly coming into contact with it as she jumps into a pizza delivery truck. The bus, with what looks like the Queensboro Bridge in the background, reminds us of Infinity War, where Peter Parker had Ned create a distraction so he could change into Spider-Man to investigate the alien ring ship that landed in downtown New York. For the few seconds that Sylvie was touched by the smoke creature, she saw a glimpse of a strange castle in a distant dimension. Keep that in mind. Just before diving into the car, you can also see a marquee for Wrightsville Movie Theater. Wrightsville was previously seen in a prior episode after Sylvie had deployed several different time grenades and is a real life location where in the 1800s, a massive bridge collapsed. Also on the marquee are several words, but all we were able to make out were Oswald in the Marina, which could be a reference to Lee Harvey Oswald's wife, and something days, but the first word is hard to make out. If you think you know what it says, please tell us in the comments. The pizza delivery truck is being driven by none other than our favorite character, Mobius M. Mobius, with a little surfboard scent dispenser hanging from the rear view mirror. Sylvie and Mobius banter as he dodges and weaves with the truck, trying to escape Eliath. They pass by a large overgrown sphinx beside a massive pyramid and what looks like the corroded old fishing trawler in the distance. Cut back to the bunker and President Loki, along with his army, challenge Kid Loki for dominance over the land. Boastful Loki quickly reveals he was the traitor who gave up their location in exchange for receiving the army and becoming king, to which President Loki responds by threatening to destroy him first. This, however, backfires and forces the rest of his army to turn on him as well. And a fight breaks out, but not before Alligator Loki bites off his hand. Behind our Loki is an old arcade pinball machine called Space Mission, which was created by Williams Electronics in 1976. As the multitude of Loki variants battle it out using all sorts of magical abilities and strange weapons, Old Man Loki leads our Loki, Kid Loki, and Alligator Loki out to safety using a magic portal. They end up on a plane somewhere with the bones of a large dinosaur in the background and what looks like a crashed version of the Milano, but we can't be sure. It could also be a giant satellite weapon or a piece of a dead celestial. Loki continues to try to convince them to help stand against Eliath and take the TVA down and Old Man Loki reluctantly agrees, but only to the point of getting him to the smoke monster. Then he's on his own. Racing along the open terrain, Mobius and Sylvie exchange some banner before he apologizes for chasing her all her life. For a moment, through the window behind Sylvie, you can see what looks like a giant four-legged robot with a cannon for a head. 
This made us think of the Spider Slayers from Spider-Man. Anyway, Sylvie changes the topic, saying that when she pruned herself, she thought she would be able to find Loki. But now she thinks he's most likely dead. Mobius chuckles and insists she have a little bit more faith in him. You really believe that? Sylvie tells him to turn around. Their only chance to get out of here is Elias. Or rather, through Elias. Mobius turns the car around, and in the distance, a portal opens up, and what looks like the Avengers Quinjet drops out and explodes on the ground. We catch up with the four Lokis, putting together a plan of attack. Loki suggests a diversion, where he can then sneak around the back and stab it in the heart, or brain, whatever makes it tick. Kid Loki mocks this plan, and they step up to a cliff overlooking the landscape. Suddenly, another portal opens, and the USS Eldridge is dropped out of the sky. This ship is best known for being part of the Philadelphia Experiment, in which the government supposedly created a ship in 1943 capable of cloaking, turning completely invisible. Eliath is instantly drawn to it, racing over the open plains toward it. The crew on the ship begin to fire everything they have at it, but are unsuccessful, and it devours the ship and them entirely. It turns them into, like, energy, leaving behind nothing but ash, very similar to how Galactus feeds. One of the sailors giving the order to fire, though, looks a lot like Casey. Kid Loki notices there's a vehicle approaching them and remarks that it could be Marauders. In the MCU, Heimdall mentioned these bloodthirsty cannibalistic scavenger pirates, saying they often attempted to invade the Nine Realms. As the car gets closer, it slows down and stops, and Loki sees Sylvie step out. Overjoyed, he races to her, and he's even more happily surprised to see Mobius standing right beside her, asking them both if they are alright. As the other three Lokis approach, Sylvie gets in a defensive stance before our Loki defuses the situation, telling her that they are his new friends, other variants of themselves. Sylvie asks if they were also after Elias, to which Loki responds proudly that he's going to kill it. Bemused, Sylvie pokes fun at his plan and says that she's actually going to enchant it, that it's like a big guard dog blocking the doorway to the location where the real timekeepers are. Okay, so. Um, how do we get past the guard dog? I'm gonna enchant it. Back at the TVA, Renslayer goes to visit an imprisoned B-15. She accuses her of being disloyal, to which B-15 responds with... Disloyal? Did you think you'd escape punishment for that? Disloyal to who? You were in the timekeeper's chambers, they weren't real. Renslayer disregards her words, saying that keeping everyone pacified and operating smoothly is the only thing that matters. Renslayer then asks her what drives Sylvie. B-15 happily obliges, telling her it's all about revenge. However, she also makes an observation that Renslayer is also after the real timekeepers, but that she won't get to them before Sylvie does. Renslayer leaves, contacting Ms. Minutes and ordering her to retrieve all files on the creation of the TVA, telling her that she needs this information in order to find them and warn them. Again, we here think that she's secretly working for Kang, and her mission is similar to Sylvie's, but instead of just taking them down to let everyone be free, it's so that Kang can take over. We cut to Mobius and Old Man Loki sitting around a fire, discussing whether Alligator Loki is truly a Loki variant or just someone pretending to be, which arguably makes it even more of a Loki. Kid Loki interjects with a question for Mobius, asking him what will he do once he returns to the TVA. Mobius replies by saying that he'd spread the truth, that it's never too late for anyone to change. Outside, in the grass, Loki and Sylvie share a couple of tender moments, talking about what they will do when it's all over, and Loki conjures up a blanket around them, snuggling up to her, proposing that they could spend their free time together. He promises her that he will never betray her, and this takes her aback at first, but then she decides to trust him. We cut to a shot of those strange blue bird-like creatures 
running across the land and hopping onto an alien tank, which kind of resemble those used by Annihilus' armies in the Annihilation Wave storyline. As the Lokis gather on the cliffside, a storm begins to form as Eliath is on the prowl, and we can see the remnants of Ronan the Accuser's ship, Dark Aster, crash in the distance. Sylvie gives them all a Captain America-worthy pep talk, telling them that she linked with it earlier and had visions, which leads her to believe that she will be able to enchant it. She hands Loki Renslayer's Tempad, but he tells her that he's staying by her side and gives the device to Mobius. Mobius offers the other three Lokis a way out, but they all agree to stay as well, Kid Loki handing our Loki a special golden sword. Mobius makes his exit, but not before giving Loki a big hug and telling Sylvie that she's his favorite variant. He tells Loki that he's going to burn the TVA to the ground, referencing their first meeting. As Loki and Sylvie head across the fields toward the growing storm cloud, for a moment you can see another giant stone head. This one has th three faces, and one of them is covered. This is a reference to the Living Tribunal, which was previously mentioned in Doctor Strange, as Baron Mortar wielded the staff of the Living Tribunal during a sparring match. Eliath begins to descend, and we see Old Man Loki along with Kid Loki and Alligator Loki walking off, a crashed shield held carrier in the background. Old Man Loki stops and looks back at the battlefield for a moment before continuing on after Kid Loki. The Smoke Beast dwarfs Loki and Sylvie, the battle zone littered with skeletons of long dead creatures and remnants of old battleships and other alien weapons. Loki asks Sylvie what happens if they don't have enough time to wait for another branch deposit, and she tells him that they will need to create a distraction. Loki brings out the golden sword and nods to her, and charges heroically out into the open, drawing the attention of Eliath. Sylvie, meanwhile, uses all her might to try and enchant the creature, but she just doesn't have enough power on her own. The monster turns its attention back on her, and just as it's about to devour her, it's pulled away by a strange mystical energy. Old man Loki has returned to the battlefield, and begins to conjure a massive illusion, recreating Asgard in its full glory. An impressive display of power, it manages to hold back the creature, and even Loki has to admit that he is amazed with how powerful they can be if they are pushed themselves. This gives him an idea to join his abilities with Sylvie and try to enchant Eliath together. Old Man Loki begins to run out of steam, but not before defiantly rising to his feet, shouting glorious purpose and laughing maniacally as the monster sweeps across him and takes him out. <laughs> Just before Eliath can turn around and eliminate Loki and Sylvie, however, they overpower it and manage to dissipate it, revealing a portal to another dimension. Okay, theory time. We believe what's on the other side of the portal is actually Castle Doom. It looks almost identical to the one in the Battleworld comics. As we mentioned before, we think that at some point in the timeline, Doom challenged the Beyonders and was able to acquire their power, or at least imitate their abilities through magic and engineering. He then either created his own universe, or started destroying the surrounding universes which started the multiverse collapse, possibly as an unforeseen consequence. This could be from killing the Molecule Man of his universe, which, long story short, was created by the Beyonders and placed in the various multiverses to act as a kind of bomb that, when detonated, would have a ripple effect and, like a game of dominoes, knock all the other universes off balance. Not necessarily for nefarious purposes, as the Beyonders are omnipotent beings and their motives are almost scientific. Anyway, this could be the very multiversal war of which Miss Minutes spoke of during the first episode, thus leading Doom to create a singular timeline. However, with groups like the Council of Reeds and the Illuminati out there trying to stop him, he created a fictional trio of beings to act as heroic figures who are protecting the universe. He then went on to create the three dimensions that we discussed before, 
And since time isn't linear, this could have happened hundreds of years in the future. I think our next big clue, if they don't outright show us the villain in the next episode, will be when Miss Minutes brings Renslayer those files and she finds out how to manipulate the time stream herself. This would later all set up a struggle toward the end of Phase 4 be between Doom, Wanda, Kang, and whoever else, until it's possibly revealed that coming in Phase 5, the Beyonders have found a way back to our universe. Since Marvel is taking their own approach to telling major comic book arcs, it would fit along the line of them telling their stories out of chronological order, setting up Secret Wars after having already shown us a negative outcome if our heroes don't stop Doctor Doom. Phase 5 would then build up the Fantastic Four, and possibly a younger version of Doom, in his quest for magical supremacy and power. We think, though, that we won't encounter the real God King Doom in the Loki series. Instead, of course, it will be a Doombot who never reveals his true face and is perhaps destroyed or so, leaving Loki and Sylvie stranded, or they are plucked out of danger by Doctor Strange himself, who in the comic book storyline is Doom's sheriff on Battleworld. The episode ends with Loki and Sylvie stepping through the portal hand in hand and we're not sure if the castle is located in the quantum realm, or as we said before, in its own invention entirely. It looks to be floating on a dislodged mountain, in the middle of a nebula. Either way, we are extremely excited to see what's going to happen in the next episode. If only we could time jump ourselves to next Wednesday. Also, unlike last week's episode, there was no post credit scene. So we suspect that we will most likely get three scenes after the final episode, setting up the three main MCU films that are kickstarting the battle for the multiverse. The Eternals, Spider-Man No Way Home, and Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Anywho, what did you guys think of the episode? This one was definitely filled to the brim with epic action a boatload of easter eggs, and so many questions that we have to give it a solid 9 out of 10. If you guys spotted anything we didn't, please feel free to leave us a comment down below, or you can reach out to us on Twitter, at Studios Fat. We also have a Discord channel, which you can join by clicking the link in the description. And if you're feeling generous, check out our Patreon, also linked below. If you enjoyed the video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. For all the new subscribers we have gotten over the past few weeks, we want to thank you all very, very much. It helps us out tremendously. Please be sure to share the video with your friends as well. The more, the merrier. I've been your host, Raging Antibody, for Fat Ninja Studios. And before I go, I just want to say, no matter what the obstacle is, you can do it. Believing yourself is the first step, but you also need to keep at it. Whether it's practicing a craft, pushing yourself to finish projects, or even bolstering your courage to go out in public amongst other human beings, you are capable of getting it done. And no matter the size of your fear or failure, don't let it stop you from achieving your desires. Thank you all again, and take care.